So, uh, good morning, everybody. Welcome to Troopers uh, 2011. My name is Anna Rye, and I'm supposed to give the opening remarks uh, combined with a, say, kind of keynote to get you going for Troopers. Still people coming in, which is good. I mean, um, I'd like to, uh, to see as many people in the room as possible. And it's, uh, this year it's bigger than it has been ever. I got back to this uh, during my keynote later on. Uh, what I'm going to tell you is split up in three pieces. Uh, first one is uh, some simple organizational announcements. Uh, second, I will discuss uh, the concept of Troopers, why this event exists and what's the purpose of this event. And obviously a uh, third part will be uh, to give you an idea why we think uh, Troopers is important. Um, as for the organizational stuff, there's two tracks, attack and research, it's the first one which is going to happen here in this room in the auditorium. Then there is uh, research and um, management, uh, defense and management, which is going to happen in the third floor. We will have a lunch break at 12.30 p.m. There is a badge contest. Some of you might notice uh, these pieces have a kind of uh, their own uh, magic and there will be a, a contest and at uh, whose end you can win of one of these boxes, which is a brand new shiny iPad 2. So uh, it might be an idea to uh, join that contest. All the details as for the overall organization and the, and the contest can be found in the uh, two-page flyer. Hopefully everybody of you got, if not, uh, show up at the registration desk and you will get all the necessary information. We will have a shared dinner tonight at 6.30 p.m. We will provide inf uh, how to get there in a detailed way. After the shared dinner, we will have a legendary traditional packet wars um, with a number of teams this year. And uh, tomorrow in the morning, again, this is a kind of a tradition at Troopers, uh, there was a so-called 10K run. Uh, we will have a, a run for one hour. Um, at about, uh, I mean, it's planned to uh, cover about uh, 10K. If it's 8K, it's okay as well. Um, we are going uh, up the uh, so-called uh, Philosopher's Way, one of the main um, sightseeing places of Heidelberg. Uh, so if you feel inclined to do so, uh, show up uh, at uh, either at 7 a.m. at the Marriott or we'll stop at the Cube uh, to pick people up and uh, get some fresh air, get our brains going in the morning. For those who don't know me, my name is Anna Rai. I'm the founder back in 2001 of ERNW. I'm a kind of uh, old school networker and I still, I'm still happy to get my hands dirty and to be involved in practical work. It's not just... Uh, I'm a manager running a company. I, um, I still try to be at the technical side of things. And yes, uh, I'm your Troopers host. Um, I'm the kind of, uh, uh, given it's uh, an ERNW event and I'm the leader of ERNW, uh, I'm to some degree behind this event, um, but it wouldn't have been possible without a number of people who have helped and contributed to get this going at this point. Um, a big thanks, uh, where's Florian? Uh, okay, please stand up. Uh, uh. Uh, and of course, uh, this applies to all the other members of ERNW too. Um, thanks for getting this going and hopefully we will have a great another three days. Um, ERNW is a Heidelberg-based uh, security consultancy and assessment services. Some of you already know uh, ERNW. Uh, some will have the opportunity to get an idea what we do in the next days. Um, besides, uh, I mean, we have a, what we think we have a mission. This mission, obviously, is to, uh, to help our customers perform their business. And again, obviously, uh, say we have to employ our employees and feed them. But uh, that said, we try to, um, besides uh, the paid work for our customers, we try to contribute to the public security knowledge and debate in a, in a number of ways. And uh, Troopers is one of those ways. And we 
uh, even if this might sound a bit, uh, say, emotional, we try to make the world a better place. This is uh, the understanding of ERW's work, not just uh, perform a uh, day-to-day job, but uh, to contribute to public security debate and knowledge. And there is one, say, mindset, which is particularly important for our understanding of our work, that can be broken down to, uh, say, the slogan from uh, theory to real reality, which goes back to the ancient times when, uh, in the end of the 90s, there was a, a famous um, US hacker group called Loft, and uh, they had the, their uh, slogan was uh, making the theoretical practical. And this is what, what we try to do as well at ERNW, not just discuss things on the theoretical side, but show uh, things can be done both uh, in the protective side of things and on the attack side of things. Uh, uh, it's not just theory. Uh, bring it to reality and uh, thereby contribute again to a better understanding of how security works and how things um, can happen. And this will, um, keep this in mind please, uh, this will play a role for these opening remarks as well. Talking about ERNW's work, I'd like uh, to highlight uh, the fact that we are involved in a number of uh, research projects. The uh, first of them is called Asmonia, which um, contributes to research in the uh, space of telecommunication networks. Uh, there's another one uh, together with uh, two entities from Dartmouth College uh, called uh, Trust Evidence, where we try to understand how uh, does the um, Organizational reality, uh, how is uh, trust expressed or how does, um, how do uh, ISOs, uh, for example, take their decisions? Uh, what's their motives? What's their incentives? Um, why is there seemingly a gap uh, between uh, different worlds? Um, why don't they behave in a way like, say, academia would expect? Uh, this is what we do in this project. Um, I'd like to ask some of you to contribute to this one. Um, details. Uh, uh, please uh, get back to me if you're interested um, in knowing what happens in the space and how you can contribute. These were two research projects we are involved in. There's another activity, obviously. We try to contribute to the greater good, to the greater public. Uh, that is uh, Troopers, uh, this conference. And we understand Troopers as our contribution to that exact um, space of uh, public security knowledge, public security debate, and uh, to do so, to be, say, an event which contributes to the security world in general. We try to bring together different kinds of, um, different groups which not necessarily speak to each other very often. Uh, that is, uh, people from industry, people from academia and people from the, what we call the, the, the hacker community, researchers. Researchers which are not necessarily bound to, to say academic institutions, but who perform uh, things on their own, who try to figure out um, how things work, how to, uh, how to break things. Uh, the old hacker spirit understand how uh, things happen and uh, thereby uh, progress on the personal level. These are the three groups contributing uh, to Troopers, that is people from industry, people from uh, uh, academia, and uh, as I said, researchers. We want them to interact. The main spirit of Troopers is bring these people together, have them interact, have them communicate, uh, have them educate the next uh, generation of InfoSec professionals. That's why we, every year we invite a number of, of students um, to be part of the event, as we want them to learn from these three groups. We want everybody to learn from the speakers. I mean, the speakers are here with their um, expertise and wisdom, hopefully. Uh, we want them to educate and we want everybody at Troopers to have first a good time, to learn a lot, and hopefully to uh, understand uh, each other better and um, contribute to a better understanding of um, how security works, how security in the world um, works and how to make it uh, a better place. It's getting bigger every year. Uh, every time it's uh, more people. Uh, still we 
Uh, it works um, that people communicate. It uh, has not um, become an event um, which is driven by an anonymity and um, uh, people uh, staying together and not mixing the groups. Um, uh, but it's, uh, it's getting bigger. This year we have about uh, 150 people enrolled and uh, uh, registered, um, including the speakers, which is uh, the point of view of numbers. There's another point of view that is based on perception. Uh, I have the impression it's bigger. Um, it's, uh, I, I haven't given the keynote last year. I, had, I gave it uh, the year before. Uh, at the time, um, I haven't been standing in front of so many people as today. So this is a bit like uh, every year we think um, it's, it's like Christmas. Uh, you might recall uh, every year at Christmas, it's, oh, this year the turkey is better than it has ever been, or the Christmas tree is uh, bigger than and, and more, more, more stuff on it than it has ever been. And I feel reminded of Christmas uh, to some degree today. As um, I mean, I'm I'm on the eve of uh, kind of uh, I'm introducing troopers, and it's going to start. And this is like uh, how a kid feels on the eve of uh, Christmas, uh, like uh, looking up to great things to happen. <laughs> ah, yes. I mean, um, uh, obviously, uh, hopefully, troopers is a present in itself. But uh, there there might be might be a, a various uh, means of. Uh, getting your own uh, presence, uh, feel reminded of the... There's an iPad too, which you, could, which you can collect from a kind of Christmas tree. Maybe we will bring Christmas tree to, tomorrow and, and you can pick it there uh, if you win the contest. Um, again, Troopers is about bringing people together to give you some numbers. It's about 60% of people from industry. We have 15% uh, from academia. There's 10% uh, um, roughly from, say, the research community, and uh, we have 15% students. This is what, um, how the troopers are uh, assembled this year, and they are from various parts of the world. Uh, so hopefully this will uh, stimulate uh, discussion, this will stimulate exchange, whatever. Why troopers uh, is so important from our perspective? The InfoSec world is changing. There is currently, there is uh, heavy architectural changes. I mean, the infosec world is changing all the time, and this is one of the challenges, and this is why I particularly like my discipline. Uh, why I, I, I'm really glad to be involved in infosec for um, 14 years now, as uh, it never gets boring. It's always, um, there's new challenges, uh, new attacks, uh, new uh, protection mechanisms, um, and all this. But uh, at the very moment, there is heavy architectural change, uh, which might, uh, again, heavily change the way how um, we perform InfoSec and uh, how it, uh, from our perspective, should be performed. At the same time, uh, for most of you, say the area of responsibility uh, grows. There's more systems you're responsible for, there's different types of systems you're responsible for, there's a higher variety of systems, a higher degree of heterogeneity. So um, again, it, it won't get boring, and uh, it won't get boring as the number of, um, or the nature of attacks changes as well. It's not just uh, the asset we have to protect undergoes change, it's uh, the threats change as well. And those two effects together mean uh, one has to constantly learn, constantly progress, constantly improve um, to keep up with the pace, and that's why Troopers is there. Getting back, uh, discussing this type of change. I mean, um, a keynote is meant to be, uh, say, an, an, to some degree, a simplification of things, and let's have a simplified look at uh, the way networks work. Uh, look today, uh, there is a service, there is clients. Um, this might somehow uh, change and vaporize. What is going to happen is uh, servers will move to, uh, let's call it the cloud, whatever the cloud is. Uh, intelligence, front-end processing, largely moves to systems uh, that I call uh, smartphones here. Uh, so what has been your network with your systems at some point of time 
uh, and your network mediating access between those uh, systems uh, will go to uh, yeah will go to the internet. It's no more uh, your systems, no more your network. Um, it will be somebody else's systems, uh, maybe um, the front-end processing engines uh, not being under your management control, and uh, it won't be your network where the stuff happens. And this is not only a technology change, but this brings heavy architectural and conceptual implications as well. Uh, two main, uh, for some of you, two main, say, pillars of the of your infosec architectures might go away. First, the concept of locality, the understanding like, okay, I know where the systems are, and that's uh, why I can protect them to some degree, maybe by physical, physical access controls, or by um, whatever type of things that are bound uh, to the location where a system is, um, uh, can be found. Uh, all these types of security controls will go away, and it's not only the concept of locality uh, is gone. Some of you might think, okay, um, we have had laptops in our organization for 10 years now. Uh, what is this guy talking about locality? Still, having laptops in your organization in most of uh, the places might have meant, okay, these are company provided entities. Uh, so you have some kind of administrative and management control over them. And again, this one, um, this is at least our understanding at the MW will go away. It won't be, you, at some point of time, large elements within this diagram I just showed, and I'll get back to this one, won't be under your control. But, uh, I mean, this is only one part of the things happening. Another part is, at the same time, you get even more systems that will be connected to your networks that uh, you will have to take care of on the security side of things. Uh, there might be uh, what we call the Internet of Things. Um, all types of entities getting connected to networks and having to be secured. Embedded systems of all types. There will be a number of, uh, there will be some talks on uh, embedded systems uh, or types of embedded systems at Troopers. Uh, there might be control networks, which in the ancient times uh, have been run uh, completely separated by a separated uh, group of people. And now these, all these things are much. And uh, there is some conclusions to draw out of these developments. Uh, the first one is um, a concept of system management. Looking at uh, elements like, um, say, the, the cloud thing. Um, the concept of system management, like I perform security operations. I perform uh, security functions by having administrative control over things. Uh, this one will go away to some degree, and this one will have to be the replaced, what I call a trust management. Uh, you are no more on the, some of you as ISOs might have noticed, oh, uh, five years ago, a large part of my work um, was uh, doing some technical uh, things, or reading technical documents and evaluating things from the technical point of view, and today, uh, 10 or 20 or even 40 percent of it uh, uh, negotiating contracts and understanding what's in the contracts and dealing with legal. Um, this is a, a heavy change and uh, this from our perspective means uh, you have to get uh, some understanding what means, uh, what means trust, what means uh, to work together with a, with a third party and expect this third party to act in the, uh, in the sense of their own interests, uh, which is not about control. Some of you might still have the understanding like, oh, when we go to the cloud, when we uh, hand over uh, things to a third party to perform for us, we must, must, we must audit them, we must monitor them, uh, we have to have some instruments of um, looking at and observing and understanding what they do, uh, and then we can feel safe if we have those instruments. Um, this won't work. Trust is not about monitoring and controlling and observing. Trust is to expect a third party to, have, to act in my interest without the ability uh, to control it. 
I mean, if I trust you, I hand you over the keys for, say, my, my house. Uh, here's the key for my house. Uh, uh, feel like at home, uh, and I, I'm going to leave. Uh, if I do so without cameras in my house, and I trust you, if I have a number of cameras in my house, uh, and I can at every time I can look, okay, well, what, what is he doing in my house? Then I don't trust you, obviously. And what you will need is an approach of trust, uh, and not an approach of control. I mean, um, did you ever, ever audit RSA? You didn't. You trusted them. And um, maybe um, potentially they failed. But you trusted them and you did so for whatever kind of reason. And what I want to recommend you is try to understand who to trust and why to trust those entities and uh, understand um, what uh, trust is based on. I mean, I'm not talking about faith. Faith is blind trust, like, oh, uh, God will make things uh, happen in a, in a way that's good for humanity, which is a perfectly valid um, stance. But understanding why and how to trust entities will be one major part of your uh, future work. Uh, I gave a keynote at some other event I'm referring to here. Uh, there I have outlined um, what I think are valid reasons for trust, like asking questions, okay, um, how did some third party behave in the past? Um, how much information do they give me? Do they trust me? Uh, who they, do they depend on? There's all so sorts of questions that can be asked to give a, a say, verified or a trust that is based on reasons. And for some parts of your IT infrastructures, you have to develop, uh, say, an approach of trust. Uh, that is uh, the first, um, say, um, piece I want to deliver for my keynote. The second one is, I mean, some of you might, um, might not be the first time they hear a key keynote of mine. And uh, there is a uh, history repeats. I'm, I'm known to be stuck to very simple security rules. And uh, this, again, is something I'd, I'd like to, uh, to get you um, to understand, or hopefully um, to get us a message once we get into troopers. There are certain security fundamentals, and those fundamentals are there for a reason. And looking at uh, this type of things, it turns out that, uh, I mean, uh, this one has to be addressed by some methodology of, tr of trust, but uh, let's have a look at this one. Uh, let's have a look at the uh, smartphone side of things. It turns out um, uh, some elements within this overall picture are quite in an immature or infant state when it comes to their security. Uh, this might apply to control networks to some degree. This might apply to uh, smartphones, and to illustrate this, uh, I'll give you a, cit a citation uh, from, a, uh, from a certain paper on computer security, which goes like, uh, another major problem is the fact that there are growing pressures, growing pressures from, say, management or VIPs, uh, to interlink separate but related computer systems, which are, at the time, maybe not computer systems in the in the traditional sense of word, but, but pieces like this, uh, into increasingly complex networks. Yes, this is what we currently see. And there was underlying problems, which might be uh, operating systems do not provide adequate support for computer security, which in itself might uh, lead to a number of, uh, uh, say, security problems or security implications. And uh, if you agree that what's written here, to uh, some degree, applies to the current world of these computing entities within your networks. Uh, the interesting thing is, uh, when was this paper written? Actually, this is, uh, some of you might know this one, um, the, uh, the acad uh, say, academic uh, side of people here might know this one. Uh, that's Anderson's paper on computer security technology, uh, the, the computer security technology planning study which actually was written in 1972, um, the year where uh, there were computers, uh, computer games was like this, uh, Pong. This is the age where this uh, paper uh, was written. And interestingly enough, 
Many things in this paper apply to certain types of systems in your current networks, which leads uh, to another conclusion. If the problem statement hasn't changed since 40 years, maybe the ways to address it haven't changed since 40 years. I strongly recommend uh, to go back to, um, uh, in humanities one says ad fontes, go back to the origins uh, to try to understand uh, the world. And I think um, in computer security, understanding the basic fundamental principles laid out at uh, ancient times or laid out in things um, that we at ERW call the Seven Sisters. Understanding these fundamentals and understanding how these fundamentals may help to secure computer networks um, uh, should be a, a quite important piece of your, of your work. This stuff was written for a reason and there's wisdom in it. And please um, follow this wisdom, follow the simple rules. So, to give you, um, say, an application of a simple rule. Again, a keynote is meant to be transport simple messages, and there's one that I'd like to, to transport here. Uh, looking at this um, uh, part of things, uh, my, um, there was a simple, simple conclusion I derived from this. Uh, this part of things in most networks is or will be an unmanaged mess. You won't be able to secure or to control this stuff with means, uh, with technical means you have been used to in other parts of your network. So I allow myself to give a very simple, uh, say, recommendation here. Uh, please, please, please do not process if you can somehow avoid this. I know, I mean, we are InfoSec people. We, we serve, um, say, uh, corporate organizational interests, um, but keep this in mind. Do not process sensitive information on smartphones. Regardless of what uh, you learned yesterday, maybe at the Michaels and Rainer's workshop uh, for for iPhones and maybe there is uh, certain places where stuff can be controlled and managed. But uh, you should expect uh, maybe in, in three or six months um, the same VIPs in your organization currently asking uh, for use of smartphones. They might ask for another gadget with, which is Android based and uh, latest at that point forget about uh, security by uh, controls or technical means or whatever. This is an unmanaged mess. And if, uh, say, a, a fairy godmother turned up and said to me, okay, Anno, you have one, one wish as for the security of such types of devices, it would be do not process um, or store sensitive information on those. Uh, this will not work in the uh, mid or short, uh, in the long term. So far, I've covered a number of um, what I think are uh, architectural changes in the InfoSec world. Um, unfortunately, it's not only the asset we have to protect that changes. Um, the world outside, uh, with its uh, threats, uh, changes as well. And uh, if there is one lesson one could um, derive from the, say, last 12 months, since last Troopers, or maybe from the whole year 2010, then it's this one. New threats and new attacks and new types of attacks will show up. Uh, so we have to prepare, be prepared mentally at least um, for this. Um, uh, there is, uh, I'm going to, uh, to discuss uh, some of the stuff that has been happening and uh, to try to draw some conclusions in, uh, of it. When uh, 2010 started, uh, some of you might know there was initially the, um, in, in January 2010, Google made, made an announcement like, okay, uh, presumably uh, some systems uh, have been hacked and we suspect, uh, say, Chinese authorities to be behind it. Uh, whoever was behind it, this could have been, a, say, a wake-up call. And as we know, in the meantime, it wasn't just, uh, say, Google and Adobe, but it was uh, several many thousands of uh, large U.S. Um, organizations uh, were affected by this one. And if this one hasn't been a game changer, like, okay, something happens in the, uh, the outside world, certainly this one was. Um, I mean, no, no InfoSec uh, keynote in, in early 2011 without mentioning Stuxnet. Um, 
Stuxnet was, or could have been, or may, maybe um, actually is, a, a kind of game changer. The interesting question is, why might Stuxnet have been a game changer? What was so special about it? Yeah, it was a targeted attack, okay. Uh, these uh, things happen. Uh, it used uh, for zero days, which means uh, somebody was uh, serious about getting some, some job done, but uh, zero days being around and being used for attacks in itself is not, is not new. Uh, probably Stuxnet was not developed, say, by um, uh, Joe Hacker and his friend uh, sitting in a garage, but um, again, uh, this in itself might not be uh, groundbreaking. The main point of Stuxnet, from my perspective, is its mere existence. Stuxnet was there, so it was a proof from theory to reality. Imagine you, you would notice uh, an unknown flying uh, object um, flying through the skies of Heidelberg. Uh, maybe you wouldn't be interested in, uh, say, the, the nature or the type of object, but it would somehow change the way you uh, see the world. And this is, uh, from my perspective, the main lesson one has to get from Stuxnet. This attacks like this, um, whoever was the originator and whoever was the target, attacks like these might happen. It's not just, uh, uh, say, paranoid uh, infosec guys like, uh, oh, this might happen and uh, uh, following some lines of thought of a conspiracy uh, theory. Um, um, bad things might turn up, uh, but bad things turned up. And if, uh, say, two months ago, in your own organization, you, you would have speculated um, about, like, hey, what would what, what happen if somebody breaks into RSA? Um, people would have looked at you, oh, you're crazy. Um, this will, it's not going to happen, you're paranoid. So please, take the lesson of things that have been theoretical at some point of time might happen in reality. And uh, I can't refrain from this one. Talking about Stuxnet, uh, I'd like to point out some things. Uh, presumably, Stuxnet uh, was uh, initially deployed in, say, the, uh, in the networks where it was uh, supposed to cause harm by a contractor's USB device. There was a, sorry for that, guys. Um, that's a simple lesson. Why allow external USB devices in, to be protected networks anyway? I understand, especially in the, in the type in, in control networks, one has to have a means of transporting data. But this can easily be done by, say, um, maybe USB devices that are under some organization's control, which are in a drawer uh, of uh, some, um, some desk or whatever, and whenever data has to be transported, take this piece out and use this. But do not let external USB devices to connect to networks to be protected. Um, again, if there was a fairy godmother uh, showing up like, oh, you have one wish to secure control networks, it would be do not allow external USB devices to be connected. And there's more um, stuff like this, uh, analyzing Stuxnet. I mean, Stuxnet had a number of propagation methods, but amongst those was, uh, say, um, copying itself to unprotected network shares and exploiting um, the exploit that was behind um, a config uh, dating back from um, uh, 2008. Um, simple things could have in quite some networks uh, maybe have been protected from, from Stuxnet-like uh, stuff. Uh, and finally, Stuxnet had, amongst a variety of uh, technical things it did, it tried to hide itself by installing a driver. Simple question again, um, what's the need to install drivers on production and on control network machines once they are in production? How often do you need to install a driver? So lock it down. Uh, do not allow installation of drivers um, on, if you are in, in charge of secure and control networks um, on, on those systems. Simple rules might have. I mean, I'm not telling you that, uh, uh, say, um, one, 
would have been able to, to avoid an inf infection of Stuxnet uh, fully. But uh, in some networks, this wouldn't have happened if simple security rules would have been followed. Oh. Going on on the timeline. So we had, uh, in 2010, we had uh, Aurora and we had Stuxnet. Um, let's get uh, into 2011. There is uh, stuff from, say, not the InfoSec attack space that might change the way how we, how we see security. Uh, there was the, the and there was and, and still is the uprise in um, uh, say the Arab world, which uh, might have shattered the understanding of the rerouting capabilities of the internet. And there was um, uh, just recently the Japan earthquake. Um, I'd like to take the opportunity to think of the victims for a second. Back to Heidelberg and back to troopers, there's two lessons I'd like to draw from the, the Japan earthquake. First is, we are living in a globalized world. Things that happen in one part of the world are catastrophes that take, happen in one part of the world might affect infosec environments, network environments in other parts of the world and not just as for their availability. You might have noticed that Cisco, who have a patch day two times a year, one in March and one in September, uh, they deferred the uh, March patch day to September. They issued a statement like, oh, we won't, um, we won't perform the March um, patch day as we understand that some of our customers uh, at, uh, at the very time have uh, different problems to cope with uh, than patching their Cisco systems. But obviously there's some impact. Uh, as for, say, um, networks to be protected from some earthquake happening in some part of the world. Uh, and there was a second lesson that is um, talking about risk um, assessment. Uh, you might know that we at ERNW, we have a strong stance as for risk assessment and risk management. Actually, in the afternoon, there will be a panel discussing stuff like this, and um, I will be on that panel, and I will... Uh, hopefully be able to argue from the position that risk assessment is, uh, is a good thing and is needed to act um, in, a, in an efficient manner as for infosec uh, environments. Still, risk assessment only works within a variety, say, of values for normal operation uh, or for things that, uh, can, uh, that can show up and uh, can be classified into different risks. There might be events that happen, that happen very rarely, but which might be outside the scope of risk assessment. So not everything in the world can be addressed with risk assessment. There's things that cannot be addressed. And uh, I think uh, the conclusions, um, I leave the conclusions to you, but um, being able, or having the naive understanding that one can control everything by means of risk assessment um, might be, as I said, might be naive. Uh, back to the infosec, uh, to the things of uh, things happening. Um, I discussed Saxnet, I discussed, uh, say, the Egypt uprise. Just recently, more things happened. There was uh, the RSA break-in, and there was the Commodore stuff. As for the RSA break-in, uh, quite some of you are affected from this one to some degree. There's uh, lots of lots of, uh, say, speculation going on. Um, what does this mean for us and what will, um, uh, how should we act? Uh, I wrote a blog post uh, about this and I, I won't, um, say, uh, detail the whole discussion right here. Still, I'd like to ask two questions and to bring them on the table to uh, support my, my main message of these opening remarks. Uh, first is, uh, one can ask, uh, why did they keep customer seats at all? Uh, there is, an, say, an official explanation going like, oh, in case uh, the customer uh, did not have a backup of, his, uh, of uh, their uh, authentication systems, and uh, their authentication systems got screwed, they could approach um, RSA um, and ask for their seed files again. Uh, there is another explanation um, from the conspir conspiracy theory uh, space, maybe, 
which goes like, okay, RSA was uh, founded in the, in the 80s. In the 80s, some of you might know there was a large debate uh, about uh, things like uh, Skipjack and the Clipper chip and all the key escrow debate. Uh, uh, I refrain from any con conclusions here, but still, please rem remember, I try to convince you understanding who to trust and why to trust uh, entities uh, might lead to interesting um, questions and conclusions here. And there was a second thing uh, I'd like to point out. Um, uh, quite some people ask themselves, um, and I am amongst those people, let's assume customer seed files have been compromised. And that's the, uh, uh, the current, the most, uh, say, popular assumption out there as for the RSA case. Why, why were those um, uh, seed files presumably on network accessible systems? Why wasn't there an air gap uh, to, to some degree? And this might remind us there were simple security rules to follow. Uh, and uh, maybe they didn't follow those simple security rules, as did not another organization called Commodore. Uh, Commodore is, uh, I got this from the Wikipedia article, uh, article on um, uh, Commodore is a privately held group of companies offering computer software and SSL certificate products. Uh, let repeat me this for a second. Privately held group of companies offering computer software, some antivirus software, antivirus uh, vaporware from what I um, understand, uh, and SSL certificate products. Why to trust an organization who offers security products and say authentication, uh, highly valuable authentication uh, entities at the very same moment from the very same company. Uh, there might be conflicts at some time if this part of business is not running well. Uh, so maybe they have to push the other part of the business by lowering the standards or whatever. Simple questions as for the trust methodology I referred to earlier. Uh, which and, and I didn't give details at the moment, but um, there are questions like, what's the nature of their business? Um, who do they depend on? Who are they uh, related with? Asking those questions might have led to conclusion, Komodo might not be the right partner to get our SSL certificates from. Uh, and um, what uh, their public statement says, uh, presumably some registration agent in South Europe was compromised. Uh, this is, oh, this is the mafia story. Uh, oh, so South Europe, uh, the, this is where the, the, the place, the, the part of the world where the, where the sun, is, uh, uh, sun is shining and they, uh, they are corrupted anyway. Uh, actually, they only have one registration agent in, in Italy, so it's not too far-fetched um, uh, to say it, maybe it was Italy. Um, that's the story they want to tell. Interestingly enough, I have been a registration agent for, for a major German um, uh, CA uh, some time ago. And at the time, uh, I had a dedicated smart card just to perform, say, the, the registration process. Uh, and this one certainly was not easy to, to compromise with as the signing of um, uh, all the stuff was done on the card, and it was a card that had, um, at the time, at least, I think, an EAL5 uh, certification. Uh, so the story, like, oh, that guy in Italy has been compromised. Um, either they didn't have uh, good security practice, which would mean a registration agent uh, should perform its action not based on a, say, simple password, uh, or something else was wrong with them. And, um, I mean, there's more, more on this. Uh, there was a potential, uh, there was actually, there was fraudulent issuing of um, certificates for certain entities, which again <coughs> <coughs> might prove there was uh, the infosec part of the world is related with the other part of the world. As um, having those um, entities compromised might lead to, uh, say, life threatening conditions for some people in parts of the world. Uh, they spread the rumors that Iran was behind the attacks. Uh, there was even, uh, say, an Iranian hacker um, uh, confessing the whole thing in some public forum, like, oh, it was me who did it, and I from, uh, I'm, I'm from Iran, and I acted on my own. Uh, maybe that's true, maybe it's not. 
uh, pointers, they played the card like, oh, there's this, uh, we, we have been attacked by a governmental uh, entity and uh, we, we couldn't protect against this. The uh, same stuff with RSA. RSA men mentioned this uh, APT, Advanced Persistent Threat, uh, threatening us and threatening our business. I mean, it's their business. They should be able to protect and they should be able to explain you how they protect and you should ask for this to build trust to them. Uh, it's, uh, yeah, creating trust online, Commodore, maybe not so much about trust. And one might have been able to find out by asking them the right questions. This is uh, the part of the message I want to deliver. Uh, and they even had some, uh, yeah, uh, hacker, uh, Commodore hacker proof. You could, could get this certificate. Um, uh, obviously that guy, uh, pure, poor guy in Ital Italy didn't get it. Um, uh, so. But um, ask yourselves if, obviously, there are entities who are capable of breaking into RSA and presumably steal seed files. And if there are entities uh, who are able to break into, a, say, um, well-established uh, but maybe not well-run CA um, entities, uh, what would you go, in, uh, go after next um, as such a type of attacker? Yes. They, it's, uh, you should keep in mind those guys who did this stuff um, might be on their next targets, might be, uh, say, cloud infrastructures. This is at least what I would do um, uh, if I wanted to get my hands on, uh, say, centralized uh, processing and highly, uh, potentially highly valuable data. Um, it's not my intent. To, to spread FUD at the very moment, like, uh, oh, you shouldn't use the cloud um, as it may get, may get, may get compromised. Uh, my intent is to deliver free, say, main lessons to be learned from what happened in the past. The first is the theoretical might get practical. So you'd, you'd better be prepared for it. Uh, better be prepared for it means uh, you should have uh, a set of tools, I mean, we believe in, in risk assessment uh, and in a certain type of risk assessment which enables you to take decisions uh, in a quick manner. Things might happen and things might happen in a way you do not expect them. Uh, so you should be able to cope with things you have not thought up, um, thought of uh, as of today. Again, four weeks ago, nobody would have, uh, or most people here in the room would not have, uh, have expected a break in at RSA. Uh, the point is, um, now this uh, thing happened, how to deal with it? Uh, can you deal with it, uh, say, f rapidly, or uh, are you there was scratching your head, okay, oh, this, I, I never thought of this. Um, I have to get, uh, say, people together and we have to discuss uh, how to go on. Be prepared for things. That's the first lesson. Second is, figure out who to trust. Ask the right questions. Um, uh, some of those are laid out in the, in the other keynote I gave um, and I'm happy to discuss all this um, over, over lunch or at some, some point at Troopers in a personal uh, um, relationship, but um, uh, understand who you hand over, be it your authentication or some parts of your authentication system uh, or uh, say your data processing and uh, there is some um, simple security rules which are there because they have value. Uh, try to uh, always remember the, the simple stuff. Uh, this will help you in, in times of trouble. Uh, we understand, and I understand, that, uh, say, you might feel like um, uh, Alice in Wonderland when she, uh, and, uh, when she meets uh, this, uh, the, the Red Queen, which is one of the um, uh, multiple uh, say um, a bit strange um, personalities being in, in Wonderland and what happens is um, uh, Alice uh, in that in the course of action with the Red Queen uh, she starts running and she runs as fast as she can and uh, when she stops uh, she realizes uh, she didn't she did not even leave the place where, where she started uh, and she's wondering and, and says to the White Queen, like, uh, oh, in the country where I come from, if you run, uh, you are in another place um, uh, after you run. And uh, 
uh, the, the Korean response, oh, well, in, in this country, um, to keep up with the pace of things, you man, must run twice as fast. And this is part, uh, say, of the current challenge uh, that we, had, uh, we as InfoSec professionals change, uh, face. The world changes, the number of attacks changes, and we have to, maybe we have uh, to run uh, fast as, uh, uh, double as fast as we did in the past um, to keep up with the pace of things happening. But, uh, I mean, um, we think uh, there is hope and uh, one might uh, try, we as InfoSec professionals should um, face this challenge as uh, we are the troopers. Enjoy the conference. Thank you. Given this was a keynote, it's not supposed to have a Q&A session. Um, we gained uh, 10 minutes compared to the uh, actual schedule. We will have the coffee break now. Uh, feel free to approach me at any time for discussions about this stuff. Uh, again, enjoy the conference and uh, see you later in the tracks. <laughs>